Okay, so <laughs> we're uh, live, and uh, we already have someone, Amber from Germany. Hello, Amber. Uh, I don't think I've I've seen you before. Thanks for joining. <clears throat> we're going to start. We're going to talk about two things today. <clears throat> and <clears throat> pardon my uh, clearing my throat. I had a, a sore throat the past week, and it's still causing me some trouble in terms of talking. <clears throat> <clears throat> the two things we're going to talk about things we haven't really discussed that much in this channel is a computer geeky issue. It's um, it has to do with um, quantum computers. We actually reached a uh, a point for the, <clears throat> the the computer folks have been looking for for the past few years. It's called the quantum supremacy moment when quantum computers took over. I'm only going to talk about that for about five minutes it, and just draw some contrast between some of the things that um, should be immediately obvious for us in terms of our health and what's impacting the health of our country as well as people in uh, the rest of the world. The major part of the show today though is gonna be uh, about Laura Friedman. <clears throat> Some of you may recognize that name, Laura's Lean Meat or Lean Beef. Um, she actually lives about an hour away from, from where we live in Lexington. And no, this is not about a show about uh, lean beef, although we'll talk a little bit about Laura's story. Um, <clears throat> she is actually, uh, she's, are you, what's your relationship with the company now? Um, I sold the company in 2007, 2008, so I'm out of it. I knew that you did, but I didn't know if I could tell that or not. Absolutely, so. <clears throat> and I'm out of the beef business and out of control. So here's an interesting uh, point about, about Laura. She's a, she was a young Kentucky girl <clears throat> in her mid twenties that took on the beef industry and transformed it. Now what's interesting and why we're here today is that uh, Janice got us hooked up with Laura to talk about CBD. Now <clears throat> CBD is, is that stuff that's for all the old hippies that wanna go back and legalize marijuana, right? No, actually there is huge science behind CBD Uh, CBD1, CBD2. We're going to talk about those a little bit uh, later. I'm not going to get too deep into it, but <clears throat> I am going to just cover that enough to, um, excuse me, uh, I'm going to cover that enough to, um, to help put it in perspective uh, for this channel. So <clears throat> before we, let's get started. Uh, let me make sure I can find our slides. The first uh, story starts back up in spring of 2018. Uh, hold on just a second. Let me confirm with Clyde that we're actually presenting what I think I'm presenting. And pardon me for having to keep my uh, headphones on. Clyde's co-presenting with me. Clyde, are you able to see that? Okay. So in the spring of 2018, the, uh, the most powerful uh, computer in the world, the biggest, the strongest, the fastest was built in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Uh, this is a picture of it. <clears throat> I saw it and the first thing I thought was, wonder what the CPU looks like. Well, the um, CPU, there's over 9,000 CPUs. They had 8 billion transistors in each of those CPUs. And for those of us who, uh, uh, old guys who have done any computer gaming, it probably you would think if you could control it would be a huge uh, gaming computer too. It had over 28,000 graphics uh, processors with 21 billion transistors in each of those. Um, <clears throat> but here's what happened. The guys at Google took a, sing a computer, a single computer they made with a single chip that they made. They call it Sycamore. They've solved a problem that would have taken Summit the, the Oak Ridge computer, 10,000 years to solve. Sycamore, their little single chip computer, did it in three minutes and 20 seconds. So <clears throat> just had to make that comment. Obviously we're making huge progress in terms of figuring things out. But to me, <clears throat> this is the computer, the chip that they used. They actually uh, found out that one of the the qubits, Q-U-B-I-T-S, in other words, quantum bits, 
um, was it working? So you wonder if that bit had actually been working, maybe they could have beat three minutes. Big uh, development for the computer world. It makes me frustrated doing what I do because the CDC, for example, uh, un way underestimates their number. They say at least 80 million of us uh, adults in the US have prediabetes. Therefore, we're burning our arteries, we're uh, burning our uh, eyes, our kidneys, setting ourselves up for heart attack and stroke and, uh, and <clears throat> um, Alzheimer's. And yet we can't figure out who's got it. The tests are not that difficult. We don't have to build a new chip. We don't have to uh, create a quantum supremacy moment. Uh, all we have to do is go get tested. So <clears throat> I'll leave it at that, not go any further. Thank you for uh, tolerating my frustration over that issue. I'm going to come back out and we're going to talk about Laura for a minute um, and talk about uh, CBD. Now, again, I made my first, let me make sure that we're set up. Uh, Clyde, are we set up uh, showing Laura and Janice and me now? Okay. So I made, okay. I made my first uh, recommendation to a patient yesterday to consider CBD. And I got the reaction that you might, sir, a couple of bouts with it, had um, serious problems in terms of, uh, of eating. Uh, their BMI was less than 15. <clears throat> um, there was concern about uh, pain. There was concern about uh, uh, central nervous system inflammation. And so you listen to those those four things that I just mentioned. And I said, you might think I'm crazy, but I'm gonna ask you, have you tried CBD? And the answer was no. And I said, well, when you went through some of your cancer episodes, I'm guessing they probably um, asked about uh, medical marijuana. Yes, they did, but I just don't wanna take marijuana or anything related to it. So again, that helps underline the lack of knowledge that's out there about CBD. I wanted to take a few minutes before we got into your story, uh, Laura, and want to let Janice introduce you. But I wanted to give folks a little bit of understanding about the science behind CBD. <clears throat> it was, um, what, early 90s and mid 90s that two different receptors were discovered, CBD1 receptors and CBD2. They actually even did the amino acid sequences for both of those receptors. Now, why that's important is this, the, the human body doesn't make receptors for a chemical that's in a plant somewhere. Right, something they don't have, yeah. Right, the human body makes receptors for things that we have. So we, it, that was a strong signal that we have uh, what we call endocannabinoids. There's a whole system. And we'll talk about the, just very briefly about the purposes of it. Uh, you can remember, eating. Uh, and those of, of uh, us that did use marijuana in the past, I didn't. I had, I had two experiences with it and both of them were bad. So I was never a, a marijuana fan. I'm not one of, those, uh, one of those old guys that has any interest in it. But you may have remembered the term getting the munchies. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. So um, that actually was what was utilized first in terms of medical utilization utilization in medical marijuana. It was used for HIV patients, cancer patients that were losing weight um, to a serious extent. And it, the CBD2 receptors and CBD1 receptors, both are very much involved in uh, appetite and the ability to create an appetite. So that's E out of the MMPE. Let's go back and talk about uh, the next one, memory. Uh, you may remember the hippocampus, that's the part of our brain, which connects all the dots. It's, um, it actually connects uh, other, other nerve cells within our brain together. It is the place where memory is a big issue. When we're looking at somebody for, <clears throat> excuse me, for Alzheimer's, one of the things we do is we get a, uh, an MRI quantification of the size of the, um, <clears throat> the hippocampus. The reason I bring that up is CBD1 receptors are very, very prevalent. 
very high concentration within the hippocampus. So a, a memory component. Um, <clears throat> memory, mood, the second one. I, one of the most common things, when you do see people mention CBD oil on, um, on the internet, most people are talking about mood. The two uh, big mental, biggest mental health disorders in terms of prevalence in the US and everywhere else are depression and anxiety. They go together and both of them are very much related to, um, CBD is very much related to that, the CBD1 receptors. <clears throat> There's another component with CBD. And again, we don't understand all of this. We'll talk about the lack of research, medical research in this area in a few minutes. <clears throat> A lot of it has to do with the fact that it was linked so tightly to marijuana and THC. But CBD also is a uh, very, much relink, very much linked to neurotransmitters. You may have, some of the viewers may have heard of um, norepinephrine, dopamine. These are things that are very much involved with, uh, with depression and anxiety. And again, CBD is a, very much linked to that activity. So that deals with M. Protection. And, and that gets to Laura's story. I think Laura will share with us some of her curiosity and interest in protection. <clears throat> Actually, if you look at Laura's website, one of the first things they mention in terms of the science of CBD is a very interesting thing that happened from the NIH. There were three people at the NIH who actually got a patent on CBD for protection of inflama uh, from inflammation for the central nervous system. Now, most people, and my first reaction was, you know, the NIH is not that much into uh, patenting. Uh, that's weird. But I looked it up, and yes, it's very much true. In fact, one of the three people that were involved with it was a previous Nobel Prize winner. There is very, very clear and very interesting uh, science around CBD and protection of central nervous system um, components. Is it because that it's a central nervous system antioxidant? Maybe. Is it because of the, the, the dopaminergic uh, or the, the neurotransmitter activities? Maybe. We just don't know. So there's a lot of a lot of things that we do know, there's a lot of things that, um, uh, that are, that are having a big impact in terms of CBD, but there's just a lot of stuff that we don't know. Before I hand it over to Janice to introduce Laura, I'm just gonna suggest one other thing. If you think uh, CBD is, a, is a, again, if you're still skeptical and thinking it's not really a big deal, look up Dragon's syndrome, D-R-E-G-E-N-S. Dragon syndrome is one of two very unusual but very dramatic seizure disorders that you see with children. Very recently, the FDA approved CBD oil for Dragon syndrome. These kids, some of them would have seizures hundreds of times a day, two and 300 times per day, and they could not function, their parents could not function, and um, there was no uh, effective treatment until, again, use with CBD. So as you begin, if you see, if you look at that video and see some before and after uh, videos with some of those kids, you'll realize we're not talking about something trivial here. So I'm going to hand it over to Janice. Maybe Janice, you can talk with us a little bit about how you got introduced us to uh, Laura. And then Laura, I'd like to talk with you more about your story and some of the things that you've done, both in terms of pioneering the, the beef industry and now pioneering the CBD. Yes. Okay, I'm Dan Sterritson. I have not been on YouTube Live before with Ford, but I am his better half, both in the business and I am his wife, co-owner of PrevMed. Um, the way things occurred for me in discovering uh, Laura's business with uh, CBD oil, I was in a local candy store in Lexington, Kentucky, and I ran across dark chocolate with CBD oil. And I thought that in you know, stores and um, strip malls. And I thought, this looks so questionable to me that, you know, they're selling CBD oil, but what do we know about these people? 
So anyways, they had a little um, history of Laura's work and I read it and I'm like, Laura's lean beef. I have been eating that for 25 years. Um, I know she has a good footprint in production and manufacturing and has quality processes. And now she's in the hemp business and um, producing CBD oil. So that really piqued my curiosity. Yes, I did leave with a bag of those chocolates, amongst other things, and um, went home and talked to Ford about it. As many of you who are acquainted with our business, PredMed Heart Center, our focus on, is on preventing heart attack and stroke, and also preventing and diagnosing prediabetes early, as well as mild cognitive decline. The common theme for all of these chronic diseases is inflammation. And so I was very interested to find out that CBD oil helps with inflammation. Some of the other symptoms our patients experience are sleep disorders, anxiety, stress, and pain, as well as memory loss. So I was very um, piqued by curiosity about Laura, and so I emailed her and got in touch with her. So I'd like to introduce Laura. Again, as I mentioned, I have great faith. I read up on her processes with the CBD oil, and she's right there as she was with her beef uh, or lean meat. And um, that's why we're here to get today as a group to speak. So Laura, <clears throat> you're gonna tell us a little bit about <clears throat> your history and background. We we were talking about you being a pioneer in the in the beef is, industry, what, 20, 30 years ago, and you brought up the point. <clears throat> the folks that were in this uh, log cabin before they were pioneers too. They were Absolutely. pioneers too. So tell yeah. us a little bit about that. So uh, I basically come from a long line of pioneers. Uh, uh, this was a, a relative on my mother's side, which is through Boonesboro, and uh, the rest of my family, with one exception, they're all Scotch-Irish Appalachians. So I've got I've got the kick to me, the pioneer to me. That's interesting. So did you you didn't grow up in this home? No, I grew up uh, on in West Clark County in the fancy house. Oh, and, okay. But then uh, it's functional <laughs> disaster finishing style. Basically, my family. Uh, uh, got into some money trouble uh, through a lumber mill that they'd had since 1914. And, um, uh, you know, and they had to sell that farm, and I moved out here anyway. So, uh, uh, and so all the kids came home to help pull the family together, and we did it. So in terms of geographic orientation, we're about an hour from where we live in Lexington now. When you were, where you grew up, was that nearby as oh, well? Oh, it was in, almost in, in Lexington. It was, it was in the Bluegrass. <coughs> it was right okay. over the Fayette County line in Pine Grove. <laughs> okay. So been in Lexington most of your life, except oh, yeah. for that episode in Martha's Vineyard. That's right. I, well, I actually <coughs> went to a school in Virginia for high school because I was always in trouble and they had to get rid of me. I mean, they, they, it's a senior in high school, and then I went to Duke. Um, okay. And uh, then I worked in a newspaper in Alabama. Then I came back and started farming. So you didn't train in industrial engineering or agriculture. You trained in journalism. Right? No, I have a philosophy degree. Philosophy. Yeah. And okay. my first, but my first job was as a reporter. And then, uh, but I was going to go to graduate school. I mean, that was the whole plan. And I graduated when I was nineteen. And uh, so my mentor, Larry Goodwin, said. Don't go straight to school. Go get a job and learn something about the world, which I did, and and, uh, and never went back. Never went back. <laughs> so tell us about. <clears throat> so when you, I I heard the last time we met, you were in your mid twenties, and you got involved in the beef industry, which you know to me the beef industry. When I think about the beef industry, I think about guys in ten gallon hats with big bellies lopping over mm -hmm. big old. Uh, belt buckles in Texas with, te with cowboy boots. Absolutely, that's what it was like. And so uh, basically, so... And you know, here you were, a 25-year-old girl from well, Kentucky. I mean, what happened was, okay, so, I mean, to move out here to this big old farm, first thing I needed was a husband. So I went and got a husband. <laughs> and uh, a real first family Virginia type guy. 
And he, I mean, he thought he was marrying big money. <clears throat> and then my family lost all the money, right? And uh, so, I mean, he was mad, he wouldn't work. And uh, so I said, <laughs> whoa, what are we gonna do here? Um, I got a problem. And I, I had just, you know, just had a tiny you know, new, newborn baby. And um, I said, I'm gonna have to uh, do, do something. And so I'm gonna build a company. And I got the idea for the company by going to the National Cattlemen's Association meeting in 83. Where was that? Uh, it was in Denver. Okay. And so um, I went to sign up for the field trip. I was with my dad, my husband, my mother, and me. And so I went to sign up for the field trip with, with mother. And they said, oh, you don't go on the field trip with the cowboys. You're a cowbell. You go to a fashion <laughs> show. And so I looked at my husband, I guess we got a fashion show. Uh, and we did. But when it was over and mom and dad flew back and Rose and I were staying out there to go and see his brother who was in Fort Collins. And um, so I said, I want to go see what you saw. And so off we drove and I saw a hundred thousand head of cattle on feet and uh, low cost protein production. And I said, boy, if anybody really knew about this, you know, any, any normal, person shopping for their family, they would be a little appalled. They would be appalled. Not a little appalled, they would be appalled. And um, so that gave me the idea of uh, doing local, in particular, no antibiotics, no growth hormone beef. And so I went back and started large organic beef, but nobody bought it. So this was like, what, who, what was his name? The Jungle, was it Upton Sinclair? Oh, well, uh, Upton Sinclair this, was a jungle. That was all Chicago pack yeah. plants. <laughs> but I mean, it was your Upton Sinclair moment. It that, was, yeah. That this is the beef that people are putting on their table for their kids, and it's really and ugly. They, it's full of good. antibiotics. Yeah. It's full of hormones. It's full of. And there was a guy uh, <laughs> from Tufts who done some work on antibiotic in in cattle and in livestock in general, and uh, named Stuart Levy. And I happened to have read his work mm -hmm. just because I read a lot. And uh, so when I saw feed low grade antibiotics, I knew that couldn't be good. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was really pretty easy for me to connect the dots, but it get hard to sell. And so, you know, this is back in, now it's 84. And um, everybody wants low fat. Remember, yeah. fat is bad, lean is good. And which and turns out not, not to be correct. Right, but, I'm glad you but, got that in there, by the way, because most of the people <laughs> watching are gonna be no, I, I get that now. And, uh, but, you know, back then I didn't. And so I said, okay, I'm going to make it large lean beef. It sounds pretty good too. And, um, but raised with no antibiotics, no growth hormones, no reprocessed animal tissue, no wood waste, all the stuff they were feeding cattle industrially. And, um, uh, you know, got it on the market, got it into Kroger, and pretty much that was it. Just then it was all work. Once you get into Kroger, yeah. it's, uh, that blew it up. Well, it? no, once I got into the car, but then I had to get my mother to go get all her friends from the garden club to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> you needed your first sales. I made sure that sold through. That's and, interesting. And that was what it was. How many states did you end going into? Alaska, and we're in Canada as well. Okay. So you did that, been there, done that. Then you got interested, you, or you said you lost interest. You sold the company. No, I sold the company because I had the big horse smash up. Oh, oh. That, I got the, I got the. So tell us about that. I had that sequence backwards. Yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> it's 2005, early summer, and um, I'd been out to Denver to see King Supers, and I took caught the early flight back. And I had had my shoulder operated on uh, because when you ride, it was a hundred jump rider. You know, you're always falling on your right shoulder. The left side gives my first to right handed. And so I'm always on my shoulder, always on my shoulder. And so I had it operated on and um, it was in a sling. But I wanted to keep riding. So um, my farm manager said, I've got a horse still neck ring for you, left handed to the neck ring. Uh, a three year old to ride. It's up in the barn. I'll leave it there for when you get back. So I got my curly. I ran up to the barn, checked the saddle on it, and got on that horse, a three-year-old to ride, and I had no idea what happened. I assume 
then I got spun off and I did put on my helmet. I, I think I probably did. Um, but uh, I, I hit right here on the cerebellum and broke my left helmet. Hmm. And um, uh, Janet, uh, who's friend of Dan Reese, uh, mm -hmm. she's, uh, she, uh, the farm manager saw me late and he, he called, the ambulance vehicle called, called Janet. She called the helicopter and they flew me to the UK. And the, from the UK, I went to Cardinal Hill for six months. But I mean, I was there. That's a long time. Cardinal yeah. Hill is major rehab. Major rehab. Right. And um, my cognition, <clears throat> you know, after three or four days was fine. Um, but it's good. It's crazy. It's good as it's ever been. Right? I was always, I was always pretty crazy and pretty manic, <laughs> but it was just the same. But uh, I couldn't, I couldn't swallow. I couldn't walk. I couldn't type. I couldn't speak. And so I went through the whole horror having doctors standing over you pronouncing things. And, um, yeah, it, it was hard. And, um, but, uh, um, I had a boyfriend at that point who flew in a, a, a doctor from South America, actually, a neurosurgeon, to look at me. And he said, he, he looked all the and said, oh, you have no lesions, you'll be fine. But you've got to reprogram your brain. And once I understood what I had to do, uh, then, you know, I had the money. So I, I did Don Yoga. I did you know, a lot of meditation. I did uh, scalp acupuncture, which did a whole lot of good. Um, and so while I was re recuperating, I was elected to the Bluegrass Business Hall of Fame. And I knew that I was going to have to go give a speech. And, you know, there was going to be on the, what do they call it? The electron. electron. The electron. Yeah, the, 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 the yeah. And um, I was mm -hmm. like, oh, no. And so um, uh, a doctor, my internist, actually went and learned scalp acupuncture for this and helped with my speech dramatically. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so that was one of the things that really did work, as did Don Yoga. But, of course, because of an injury like that, I am, uh, you know, I read everything I could on what are you going to do because I'm, I'm now at risk for, for uh, Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I started um, uh, exercising like a maniac. Uh, I started uh, patent. Um, I said, whoa, we got to go that. And so that's how I did it. I wonder, underlying Laura's motivation in her recovery, yeah. and that's a big thing for our patients in our business. Oh, yeah. She has motivation about business, but she had motivation to get well and practice well. Right, and I remember um, my aunt said to me, you know, you could just curl up and never do anything. I mean, I had disability. I could do that. You know, I never had to work again. Yeah. I had disability and possible money. But, you know, that just wasn't me, and that's some kind of genetic drive. I mean, I'm not really sure I'm not sure. So, you know, so you were transitioning into the CBD industry yeah. before I brought up your motivation. Yeah. Can I just mention that too? Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's it, one of the mantras that we have on this channel is something that John Lorshider started. His comment was, you can't supplement your way out of a bad lifestyle. You can't medicate your way out of a bad lifestyle and you can't, surgery can't get you out of a bad lifestyle. Yeah. And a bad lifestyle, pre, uh, Changing lifestyle creates discipline, and discipline requires motivation. So that's a big deal on our channel. It I is. appreciate you. And, and the reality is, in many ways for you, Laura, that's going to be a bigger story personally than CBD or anything. Oh, I mean, I mean, what happened to me with the brain is the biggest thing that ever happened to me in my life. But, you know, prior to that, I was, um, you know, from my 20s, I've, I've been a, a kind of pretty athletic. And uh, you know, my my friends all joke to me. I called it the quest for jockdom. <laughs> and of course, <laughs> I'm, I'm no jock, but I was always trying. You tried. And, uh, so uh, yeah, it was pretty natural to, for me to go into the uh, exercise every day. I, I don't miss. And that is a big thing for our patients too: is knowing what their values are and using their strengths to move forward with their wellness program. And that's exactly what you do. So let me take a break. This is a uh, YouTube live and one of the attractions is getting um, 
the uh, the ability to ask questions. So let me see if we can I can technically make that work without blowing up the um, the program. Um, Clyde, I am able to I'm able to see questions now. And before uh, when we we'll do a few questions, and then we'll get back to the some of the stuff about CBD because CBD is a whole big story. As I mentioned before, it's got a whole lot of medical promise, but it really has, it's been researched, but not enough to, uh, not enough. And a lot of that has to do with the linkage with uh, the storm on that whole issue. So I'd like to get a little bit more information about that, but let's do with a few okay. questions first. Angelus ad tenebris. Uh, Yep, better half, LOL. Yes, she is the better half. The upload is stuttering <laughs> occasionally, catching up. Okay. Uh, Chris Seal, I'm able to follow. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Uh, yes, I can follow just noting. James Cantor, good to see you. Yes, it'll be fine for two minutes, then we'll slow down, almost freeze up. Uh, sorry about that. You know, some of this may be the fact that we're way out uh, in the country. Um, <clears throat> I was helping a, range, a rancher once and they called it turkey medicine. Don't ask me why, but the mixed antibiotics and I believe steroids are growth hormone and gave it to his cattle. Yeah, that's a major part of uh, what Laura was doing was turning that around in the, uh, in the beef industry. Uh, <clears throat> Hello from Nebraska. Hello, uh, Susie Penguin, thanks for joining. So James Cantor, so head injury led to interest in CBD, right? Exactly. Yes. You know, there's head injury, plus I'd had a horrible kind of arthritis. You know, again, I'd, I'd fallen off so many horses for so long that, you know, my, I mean, everything's a little busted up. <laughs> <laughs> you did and with have, that comes arthritis. And with that comes arthritis, yeah. That is interesting. You did have, uh, I don't know if it was demons or interests or what it is, but you did have a lot of motivation there, didn't you? Oh yeah, I mean, I not only rode, I rock climbed. Bike rides and probably the worst action I had that way was getting run off the road by a truck. So, I mean, I've been, mm. I've been in plenty of ditches. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting. I, we, uh, we've got, um, Richard Lund, thanks for joining Richard. Uh, congratulations on the achievement. Uh, Terry Wyatt would like to try CBD, but can't take the risk of a drug test showing any THC. Can you talk about that? I sure can. <clears throat> um, we, you know, we, our brand is called Large Homestead Alternatives and we um, uh, use full spectrum CBD. So it's grown organically here at the farm. It's extracted with uh, supercritical CO2. And what that means is they liquefy CO2, they send it to, to go through the plant and get out the cannabinoids. Um, there is a small amount of THC in it, no way around it. Um, and so, um, you know, it's going to go through your liver and, you know, there's, there's I mean, you know, it, it's in your body. Now the way around it is using full spectrum, which I really think you need to do, is to use a topical only. And that doesn't go through your liver. And so um, shouldn't show up in a drug test. So Could you address full topical versus <clears throat> the liquid? Sure. And the differences? We, we do CBD three ways, basically, really four ways. One is extract, which is uh, <clears throat> just basically CB, CBD in, T, in MCT oil. And we have different uh, uh, concentrations of it. And um, you put it under your tongue and just hold it there. And it goes in through your, those glands under your tongue and in through your epithelial cells on your mouth. And that's the can uh, cannabidiol only. It doesn't have any THC, any full spectrum or anything? No, it's full spectrum. Oh, it's full spectrum. Yeah. Okay. And so it's got a small amount of THC, very small. Amount. Less than 0.3. Less than 0 0.3. 0 .3. And, it's, and you, you can that. look up, uh, uh, much of our stuff is running 0 0.1. So I saw it, your tests on that. Yeah, and we yeah. have tests, all the tests are on the website. Um, and But by law, it has to be 0 0.3 or less. less. Okay. And we're always under. 
Thank you for clarifying that. <laughs> but uh, if it's a highly sensitive test, there's some probability you will test positive, but I think it's very low. You need to understand what test is. A lot of people are going to their uh, HR department and talking to them about it. But you know, if they're firm with you, then you have to go to topical. And yeah. we are making a concentrated topical now that has seven milligrams per pump. And um, that's why I use my shovel all the time. And uh, so you and apply it, it directly to the area you have direct, pain. Directly to the area. And, mm -hmm. um, and it, it, uh, we've got some articles on the website about how uh, how this works. I don't really understand it. I'm not going to claim to. But um, but it definitely does work. And uh, but it's not as effective as the extract plus topical. So it's not systemic. Or it is correct. It is not. It's not. It's yeah. localized. So right. you're not. You're not going to get any mood impact from topical. No, you're not. Okay. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you for clarifying. So actually, that brings up a question that I think is very helpful, and the, the difference between THC and CBD. You know, people say, uh, in terms of maybe the psychoactive issue, people will say there is no psychoactive component to CBD. Well, technically, that's not correct because <clears throat> having an impact on depression and anxiety is a psychoactive activity. But there's a still a very critical difference between the two. You want to describe that? Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> I mean, uh, I am not an old hippie. I mean, I'm a teetotaler. <laughs> Me and, too. Okay, and her I mean, too. Yeah, okay. And I'm have been. Boring. Since... <laughs> that's right. We're boring. I don't break but um, this does not make you high and um, that's what is I think so great about it is that you get the benefits without feeling funny you know uh, if, talking about that specific item and maybe I'm just making some loose association here but it reminds me back of the comment about the uh, the patent the NIH usually doesn't do a lot of patent stuff, but they did in this case. And that's what intrigued you as well. It intrigued me also. I really appreciated you pointing it out. One of the things that I would say is for those folks who are still skeptic about, well, you know, is there, you know, is this just the old hippie thing? Or and was the NIH actually doing a patent to try to decrease, stop utilization, stop uh, making this a, a business? The reality is they've already rented that patent out. There, it's rented out to a company in Janice's hometown to stimulate a development of drugs. I think that uh, you may know it, can life or something like that. And they're working on developing uh, some uh, prescription level drugs sure. for uh, seizures and other central nervous system type things. Any other comments about uh, what you saw with the patent and how, and how that you? Well, um, again, it, it was sent to me by a friend who's, um, uh, you know, well educated, <coughs> and she was worried that it was going to be used to stop people. I mean, this was the first year of the hemp program in, in Kentucky, so you know that's a whole another discussion is how this hemp program started in 2014, um, and it was just barely legal with right. farm bill. You could set up research programs. But I mean, she was certain that this was going to stop all farmers from developing companies. And um, I took one look at it and saw what it did. Said, "Well, no matter who they try to stop, I'm going to get into this because it's got so many benefits that are not clear why it has benefits, but they're there. It's worth NIH patenting it." And so here was the government owning the patent. NIH is the government, of course. And the government outlaw on it also thought that was pretty fun. Yeah, it is funny. And there's still some of that schizophrenia yeah, yeah. with the government. You exactly. want to describe that for, uh, for for the viewers? The farm bill and then, the, but the FDA say, no, wait a minute, we're still controlling it. Exactly. <laughs> some of that. So um, <clears throat> the, uh, in 2014 made these state programs, and they were only a few, legal uh, for research. And we were the, one of the first people into the, the Kentucky Department of Agriculture's program. Um, then in 2018, um, uh, <clears throat> hemp and CBD by name were legalized in the Farm Bill. And uh, everybody was like, yay, yay, it's going to be so great. And I had NBC out here and I had uh, 
uh, I think to today's oh, really? show, I mean, I mean, it was a big deal. But the, the next day, the FDA came out and said, nope, we're regulating it. We still preserve our right to regulate. And so you've got two regulatory groups. You've got the USDA for the farm, um, the farm regs, farm crop insurance, all this stuff. And you have FDA for um, uh, re regulating it as a supplement, which looks like they will do. Um, and so you still have schizophrenia though. And that led all the banks to not loan money. It led, I mean, guys, I, I am financing this, our home style alternatives myself. Some companies, the ones that are trying to get rich quick fast, have gone to getting money from the Russians. Mm. Um, I mean, because I really nobody will bank it. Right. So um, so here you, you can buy from Laura or buy from the Russians. <laughs> Well, speaking of distribution, I think a lot of our viewers today may have interest in, can you sell this across state lines? Can they, these viewers are from all over the yeah. world. So how do they access your product? Uh, well, it, it's called laurismercantile.com. And the answer is absolutely, it can be sold across state lines. That's mm -hmm. part of what's in the farm bill. And they've done a good job of, of uh, enforcing that, uh, both, from the point of view of people trucking it around and from the point of view of people mailing it around. Um, uh, so that is fairly clear. I think um, the banks are, you know, they're worried voluntarily. They're just waiting for the FDA regulations. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I know it's always a disaster to try to predict, but they're waiting for the FDA regulations. What are your predictions regarding that? Well, um, uh, I've heard this coming spring. Oh, I mean, I, th I think it, I think it'll be sometime in 2020, but I'm skeptical if it'll be in the spring. Um, but uh, uh, our extractor um, is uh, getting, and I think probably has gotten up to pharmaceutical grade uh, standards, which is what you're looking for. And um, our topical producers are, for, for, are doing the same cosmetics. So everybody is understands that they have to meet those standards, and they're doing so right now. Can, it, since you said this is kind of a science interest channel, do you mind going over some of your pro, you know your processes, how you hold up this utmost quality? Okay. Oh, well, the first thing we do, and instantly it's all on the website largemarketdeal.com. Uh, it, it, we we talk about it starts from the farm, and we. Uh, the, the our license to produce it and then which is Mount Folly Farms license and um, in my license and then uh, we, sh we show our organic certificate so we are USDA federally certified organic for our hemp production then we we basically right right now so uh, they are taking samples of the CBD plants in the field and we can't harvest until they've taken those samples and the guy was going to be here at 1030 today from the government. Hmm. And then we're allowed to harvest. Now it's, of course, pouring down rain until we won't. And then we hang it in tobacco bars. We're using the tobacco model. And then uh, we take it, to, we have to take the test and our license. And we take it to Zelios in labeled a uh, super stacks. And then our own QA guy stands there while they extract this mm -hmm. I mean, we sit there and wait and um and they extract it they winterize it they decarboxylate it and then we use it to develop our extracts or our topicals all of the products that we um put up put up for sale have got uh a, they call it coa a certificate of analysis with it and uh the numbers on each bottle or each package and you can go online, just look it up and see exactly what's in it. The other thing that we do is we are certified organic, but uh, a hip is what's known as a bioaccumulator. And so it, um, it basically will suck uh, chemicals up, uh, uh, you know, atmospheric uh, pollution up, um, and so on and so forth. So we uh, test all of it for a full panel, they call it. And that's on the website as well. Yeah, that's what I found so interesting. So I would read up on Laura's website 
and you'll get the confidence that I had from reading about her product. You mentioned hemp. Maybe our viewers need some discernment between, for instance, at the candy shop, I could have bought hemp chocolate or CBD oil okay. chocolate. So maybe some clarification around that. Okay, I have two product lines. One is called Laura's Hemp Chocolates. And that was my first entry into, into the uh, candy business, basically. And I, my, my goal there was to make healthy candy. And so, you know, dark chocolate has, you know, some documented uh, health benefits if it's dark enough. And um, so I added to that uh, hemp grain, which has got, you know, omega threes and it's, it, you know, it's all on the website, but it's, it's a healthy grain, it's healthy grain you're gonna get. So I put that in the candy. Then I put in uh, uh, cranberries or raspberries because, you know, fruits, and are supposed to be good as well. And um, so that's Lars Hemp Chocolate. Then Humps, Lars Homestead Alternatives brand is with CBD. Okay. So I have two brands basically. Okay. And what's the difference? One is made with hemp grain, it's one is made with CBD hemp. Okay. Extracted. Real quick question. <clears throat> They're two totally different plants, right? Yes. The marijuana plant and the hemp plant. They're very much alike, just oh, one doesn't have much THC. Oh, they're related plants, but they are. They're all sativa. Okay. Yeah. And you just have so how do you so for example, when you say you're growing hemp, <clears throat> you could grow marijuana. I mean, you could uh, select marijuana out of that, or is the type of plant that you have the type of plant <clears throat> that we have that we grow and, and uh you know there's this whole thing with the plant genetics going on right now. But um, we are getting our starch from a very reputable um, uh, greenhouse guy, basically, over McKee. And, um, uh, and the plants that he sells us have, are documented to have very, very low levels of THC, if any. I mean, they're almost none. And so you just make sure that you buy the right plants that are not brides of concern to KDA and they have a list on the website. So it's the same genus and species, but a different varietal? Correct, correct. Okay, so that maybe explains a, a rumor that I had heard. I have a friend that, that has some connections back with uh, Kentucky. And he said, yeah, you know, the guys that actually grow marijuana really get upset when they set up a hemp farm nearby because it, it ruins their crop. It, it does. Yeah, it Very. Does. So um, uh, the hemp pollen would flow for, you know, definitely for two miles. Some people say 10. Mm. And so if you're trying to go high THC and here comes Laura's hemp pollen flowing <laughs> at you, it's definitely going <laughs> to ruin gonna your life. Ruin your crop. Yeah. Right. Interesting. So uh, just a question about Kentucky and hemp. Hemp used to be a big deal. Hemp and then was. tobacco went, and now tobacco's a problem, and now we're trying to go back to hemp, right? Well, the, the history of it is, <laughs> is really uh, long and involved. Um, the original pioneers brought hemp seed from Virginia. I mean, they were growing hemp at Boonesboro. For rope. Clothes. Rope and clothes. Okay. Really close, close, mostly. And then um, uh, hemp fiber was used for nautical, I mean, I joke around, I thought we were going to grow a rope. I mean, that was what everybody knows him for. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a big fight between uh, American hip and Russian hip back in the 1840s. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it had to do with how you read it. So how you got the woody core off and the fiber um, out. Um, you know, so, and then, you know, there was um, uh, sort of a they quit growing it. Then they tried to get them to grow it a lot in World War II because we lost uh, jute uh, in oh, the Philippines yeah. after uh, Japan mm -hmm. took over the Philippines. And so that was farmers raising hemp in World War II. That's why. And then it was outlawed again. So, you know, it's been legal, then not legal, legal, then not legal tw three times. Very so did the hemp... Um... Was that a fertile place for tobacco after growing hemp? Um, well, it turns out that um, uh, farmers from Virginia 
really preferred to back it because they made more money on it. I mean, this mm. was really, this was never a hemp farm. This was tobacco farm. Now, mm. hemp, and hemp was uh, basically a slave crop back in the day. And so there was not a whole lot of slavery out here. Then tobacco was just grown by extended families. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, breaking hemp, it was, you had to have uh, uh, rope walks, you had to have um, uh, some fairly high labor intensive and messy um, uh, infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So this farm went straight to tobacco. And then uh, when, I mean, I kicked tobacco off when I got in the health food business in the 80s. But mother always kept the tobacco money. She just moved to the next farm. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's interesting history. Hemp nautical, though, had to be exported since we were landlocked. Here. Yeah, and, and no, <laughs> they, they, would, they would take it down the river. Oh, they did? Uh, down the river to New Orleans. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. We just toured. It wasn't a hemp place when we were in Mexico last year. That's something different, isn't it? I guess so. But they did make rope from it. Yeah, they made rope from it. It was a an agave looking plant. Okay, again, I'm not really very familiar with all the back rope. And the other thing, <coughs> hemp was used to bag cotton, and so the hemp market, and of course the cotton market, which was fueled by industrialization in England and, and to some extent up east, but mainly England, you know, that fueled the hemp market here in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And the, Kentucky was always big in the hemp market, and uh, this county, Fayette County, Scott County were, and I think Franklin County were the four biggest counties. So my perspective that it was hemp, then that went down and replaced by tobacco and then maybe coming back to hemp, that's not exactly correct. No, that's more or less correct. <coughs> okay. Yeah. So there's a lot of politics right now trying to support getting Kentucky back into hemp, is that right? Yes, and um, uh, you know, it's um, there definitely everybody's trying to get Kentucky back into hip. Um, uh, mm -hmm. The uh, the tobacco settlement money uh, was used to support some of the uh, uh, processors, um, but yeah, the ones that were really trying to get rich quick fast have all gotten in money trouble, mm -hmm. and uh, they're all reneging on their contracts and just doing stuff you don't do when you're in business. And I think taking some advantage of the farmers, but you know we're just doing our own little thing over here, not paying attention to them. But uh, they definitely um, have, you know. There's, uh, is it the next Google? Probably not. No. But people <laughs> sort of were act, act, acting like was. And you came in under a grant, didn't you, when you started the hemp business? Am I? No, I have, I have not gotten any. Grants I thought there was yet. something at the state level, some initiatives at the state level. Um, not for us. Okay. Um, uh, <laughs> the governor's office of ag policy uh, did um, fund all three kinds of hemp product, hemp processing, oh, um, but no farms I know. Okay. So I've got a few comments if I could if I could share them. So Angela's uh, CBD shouldn't show up as THC metabolites in the urine that I know of. Um, Susie Penguin, thanks for the info on arthritis. Uh, Angela's, oh, I didn't know it contained any THC. Uh, 147 degrees up in Alaska. How are you doing? Sorry, I have friends who use CBD, and over time, there's an addictive component although better than opioid for low level pain, red light therapy. Are you familiar with any addictive component for CBD? I've, I've not seen that. I have not <clears throat> seen okay. any like, what is red light therapy? I'm not familiar with it. Um, I, I'm yeah. not gonna be able to answer that question. <laughs> You're a physical therapist. You I should know. I don't, I don't think it's my kind of therapy. <laughs> <laughs> No trash in heaven. Just logged in. Heard uh, heard a news blip this morning. Radio news about growing hemp in Oregon. Interesting. Angela said uh, uh, there are genetic strains that produce almost specifically CBD, such as Charlotte's Web. And I think that's some of what you were talking sure, about. Sure, and it's we're the, using that. Okay. 
147 degrees. Hemp is what rope and airbags are made from. Yeah, hemp has THC, not like uh, cannabis, CBD. The difference between hemp and cannabis is like quinoa and You're very well read, uh, as I know from talking with you. Uh, Angelus, LOL, LOL, hemp pollen wars. Yes, that's <laughs> what you're talking <laughs> about. And uh, mm -hmm. so it looks like someone from Lawrence Mercantile is, hmm, that's interesting, at four, 147 degrees west. For some clarity, hemp and marijuana are both cannabis, both contain THC but hemp contains substantially, substantially less than marijuana. You know, that might've been Savannah uh, watching and providing some information. Thank you, Savannah, if that was you or Mike. So what else uh, uh, have we got? Well, I don't know how much time we have, but of course there's the whole <clears throat> research surrounding it. So I don't know how much time you have. on. We have, we have the time that, that you guys want. What we'll have to do, you know, one of the big issues is the replays on this. Um, and the replays really decrease once you get over half an hour because you, you may have been there too and you say, oh, that's interesting. Oh, wait a minute, that's an hour and a half. I don't have time to watch that. What we'll probably do is cut it into pieces for the, for the replay. Right. But if you'd like to go ahead and talk a little bit more about the research, I think that'd be fine. Well, I mean, those are just the questions I have. We talked about some of the um, chronic diseases that CBD could address. And I know you have a lot of research on your website. Do you want to go um, into this a little bit? You know, part of um, my impetus is to always do something that is um, uh, where you can fix it in this document. I mean, I didn't do light beef. I did lean beef defined as less than 10 grams of fat per serving. And we were always in three or four. So I had a quantitative mm -hmm. aim. Uh, and I'm trying to do the same thing with ag carbon sequestration right now. Quantify it, quantify it, quantify it. Could you so, repeat that? Carbon sequestration. Carbon, I mean, th this is, you know, my whole, uh, the thing that I'm going to do for the rest of my life is I'm a climate activist, basically. But that's a whole other. <laughs> that you don't want to get into. But. Well, yeah, it's probably, it's probably not a good thing on, on this. But, um, and yeah, and the way we farm is part of that. We are sequestering carbon in our ag soils mm -hmm. uh, by being organic, by using cover crops, by um, uh, using complex rotations, by using a lot of composted cow manure, and so on and so forth. Um, but I wanted as much science as I could get on our website. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we have a chief science officer who's working for Microsoft, not Google. <laughs> and, uh, and so, so they just got, they, they got their butts whipped with uh, the yes, uh, but she news said, last week. Uh, she said, uh, <laughs> uh, it's very small and it's very cold. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, uh, so, you know, we, I haven't mm -hmm. done the job that I would like to do, and I'm hoping I'm going to get more time at it this winter, but we have got as much peer-reviewed um, uh, kind of papers as we can find or reasonable uh, uh, news articles on the website under science. Mm -hmm. And then we have all of our own tests under certifications. So, you know, we're trying to be the... Um, uh, you know, the one that's not making nutty claims. Because yeah. I even wrote the pre like, the claims about CBD are, run, are, are hard and fast, and, yeah. and we, we're not going to report those. Mm -hmm. And I would vouch for it. <clears throat> I did a lot of my own lit review, you know, the first time we talked, yeah. and I never found the information about the, uh, the, the patent, NIH yeah. patent. That yeah. was so interesting. And uh, it's right there on your site. Yeah. So you've got, for those of you that are interested, it's uh, Laura's Mercantile site in the science area. She aced me on it. <laughs> <laughs> I was always real good in school. <laughs> I thought it was that journalism background. That you, you it was her philosophy. Is that all? <laughs> it was the philosophy yeah. background, I'm not sure. Yeah, so I, I would definitely um, go to her website, read about the quality processes, read the research. There's research on Parkinson's, sleep, anxiety, depression, the things that were mentioned earlier in his acronym yeah there's a whole bunch of research in that area i i thought you know 
You're always speaking out of both sides of your mouth. There's always two perspectives. On one hand, um, there's a huge amount of research about CBD out there. On the other hand, given the promise and given what's possible, what appears to be possible with it, it's really frustrating that it, everything seems to stop. It stops here, it stops here. And um, uh, I think there's gonna be a lot, of, a lot of things that happen in the next year, obviously, a lot of interest and freeing it up from uh, from the association with the THC, I think it's gonna be a big deal yeah, too. Because yeah. in the past, you know, it's just like the fact that so few people would use it because of the legal issues and the linkage with. Anything else? Let me see if we've got any other questions. Gary Wilcher, how, how will or will CBD help with fears such as height, flying and claustrophobic feelings? Is that Charlotte's web? You know, I saw some on that. I am not, I'm not that up to speed on it. I don't know if you are, Laura. I'm not, yeah. Okay, 147 degrees. P and W have, have legalized cannabis and hemp for quite a long time. P and W, P and W unlike, unlike Kentucky. I'm not sure where. Where's P and W? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, 147 degrees west. If you could let us know what PNW uh, is, I would appreciate it. And she said red light therapy is in almost every corner in the PNW, far safer for low low level pain. If you uh, if you're doing a P test, use red light instead for that pain. Hmm. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I don't see any other questions right now, so. Please pardon me if you had a question and I missed it. Um, thank you very much for your interest. We will uh, we'll wrap up.